with this figure that one out of three women in the world had been raped or beaten and I did the math and it turned out that was over a billion women on the planet. A billion women on the planet have been raped or beaten and for days I would just lie in bed and I would think to myself, what is a billion? Like what is a billion? And then that coincided with a visit to Congo where I had just recovered um, from very bad cancer and I was not looking great and I was 30 pounds lighter and bald and the women saw me and, and what they did, which is what they always do, is they danced. It was the most amazing dance. And I started to think, wow, what if a billion women danced and all the men who love them on the planet? It would shake up an energy, it would catalyze a force, it would rearrange our cellular makeup in a way that something, I think, amazing would begin to happen. And I can't tell you what an extraordinary year we had of watching the coalitions get built, watching people come together in ways we have never seen people come together. Um, and it ended up that 207 countries rose. We think, we know it was millions of people. We believe it's close to a billion, but we will never know. And probably the biggest action on the planet ever to end violence against women and girls uh, in one day. And what organically began to happen was that all these issues that have been dominant issues around ending violence against women, whether they're economic violence or, or racial violence or environmental violence, all of them started to begin to merge because everybody wanted to dance. Everyone made it theirs but linked themselves to global solidarity. We've seen pro cases being prosecuted that were, were prosecuted with the wind of One Billion Rising. We've seen laws being passed. We've seen coalitions being built. We've seen all kinds of people come into this movement. I'd ask everybody to begin with a story of an injustice. Say you're rising on February 14th. There are so many issues you could be rising about. Um, pick one. Uh, Saru, you want to pick one? Sure. Um, so, as Laura said, I've been organizing in uh, the restaurant industry for the last decade with some of my colleagues who are here. And, um, you know, our industry right now is the second largest and absolute fastest growing sector of the economy, but it happens to be the absolute lowest paying sector of the economy. And it's not for any organic, no pun intended, reason. Um, it's because of the power of the trade lobby, the National Restaurant Association, which back in 1996, under the leadership of a man named Herman Cain, who later <laughs> tried to run for president, um, struck a deal with Congress yeah. saying that they, the other NRA, would not oppose an increase to the overall minimum wage as long as the minimum wage for workers who earn tips stayed frozen forever at $2.13 an hour. And so it has been stuck at $2.13 an hour for the last 22 years. The truth is that 70% of tipped workers in America are women, and they work at the IHOP and the Applebee's and the Olive Garden and the Red Lobster. They suffer from three times the poverty rate of the rest of the U.S. workforce, and they use food stamps at double the rate of the rest of the U.S. workforce, which means the women who put food on our tables cannot actually afford to feed their own families. And here's what's worse. If you're a woman living on $2.13 an hour, that means you don't live on a wage at all. You live off of your tips because your wages are so small they go entirely to taxes. When you live off of your tips, you're at the mercy of the treatment of the largesse of people who are coming to eat your food, who, by the way, can touch you and treat you and talk to you as inappropriately as they might, grab your butt, and you have no recourse because that is your income. For me, it boils down to um, conversations I've had with two women in the course of my work, years apart. Um, the first was a woman who was a community activist in Norco, Louisiana, and she said, I know what human rights violations are. No one has to tell me what, that my human rights are being violated. I feel it every time when I or my daughter suffer from an asthma attack that forces us to go out in the night to find the nearest emergency room. And it's at night when the facilities are at their worst, polluting and sending out gases that go right into our doorways because we're right across the street from a chemical facility that at the time was owned by Shell Oil. And up until that point, the work that I had been doing was trying to, and with success, 
um, transform environmental law into environmental justice. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a big gap. And so there are tricks in, to the trade on how to do it, but there's nothing in an environmental law that says your human rights are protected, your human right to health, your human right to life. Mm -hmm. So where are the human rights in any of that? And how do you hold your government accountable to that? And so that's one of the things that moved me in a direction of finding those human rights remedies. The second story came years later in 2005. She and the rest of her family members were wading out into water that was about chest deep to go to the Superdome for help. And so with her three children, her family members walked her back, got her up to the roof, and said, we'll be back as soon as we get to the Superdome, we'll send help back to you. Three days after the storm, one helicopter stops, and the, she's told by the person on the helicopter, two seats. And it's her and her three children. Paying attention to the news during that time, there was this stigmatization further that there was something wrong with black parents because they were separated from their children. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how people were yanked out in this very dehumanizing, degrading way that separated them from their children and other family members. And again, you look at the law. No one in this room, no one in this country has any protection when a national disaster is declared by whoever's in the White House. So far, we know that injustice is not $2.15 an hour. Justice is not two seats for a family of four. And justice is not corporately controlled federal law. Okay, so we're, we're building a picture here. Let's come to you, Donna. The story I want to tell, um, the injustice that I want to bring um, forth tonight, is about a 17-year-old that was sentenced to a 50-year-to-life sentence for a crime and a tragic crime, a horrible crime, yes, but a 17-year-old who has been inside now for 33 years. And while she was in, she's been inside, she has done everything possible to better herself in every manageable, I mean, any way possible. There are not many programs or many things available for us while we're inside, but we make the best of it for those of us that want to do something so we don't come out facing the same problems, the same situations before we, before we went in. And so this person, while she was in there, to her she fell in love with a correctional officer. To the system, she was raped. As a result, she became pregnant and she gave birth to a child. Did the system do anything about it? No. Did anyone do anything about it? No. She is still inside, serving a 50-year-to-life sentence. Her child is now 20 years old. The father has died, and the child is now facing such deep depression. Where does this 17-year-old that was sentenced to 50 years to life get an opportunity to say, hey, I am no longer that 17-year-old. Maybe, just maybe, this person is not that same person. This person has some redeemable qualities. This person has changed. This person, maybe we didn't look at what was going on with this person before she came to prison, when she was a PINS case, a person in need of service, a supervision of help. What justice would mean coming from I don't know more is what started I don't know more was the series of bills that are going through the Canadian Parliament that extinguishes or terminates the treaties in which Canada was created. And one of those bills is Bill C-45 which removes the protection of water. And water is the jurisdiction of indigenous women as well as land. And the other thing that is part of our demands is to deepen democracy through the consultation and genuine involvement of indigenous people. Sylvia, tell us a little bit about what happens to the women around the tar sands development. When you look at the extractive industries, there's a direct link between the violence against women through prostitution and the human trafficking. 
is directly linked to extractive activities of the extractive industries. And that's what's coming out of the tar sands in Alberta. That's one of the immediate impacts, but you also look at the impacts of land, which impacts the livelihood of women. It impacts, therefore impacts the family homes and also the children, because we can no longer um, go out to the land to access those things that my people depend on for food and for our culture and for our languages. This is another form of genocide for my people. Let's come back to how we connect these stories. Are they connected, and the list now has colonization, are they connected through the perpetrators, through the people who are responsible? Are they connected through our analysis? Are they connected through what we do tomorrow? How do we tell one story from so many stories? And I'm going to start with you, Kathy, because it's some of the work that you do is about helping groups see the connections that Eve talks about. What connects all these injustices mm -hmm. is an abject failure to recognize the full range of human rights for all people, here and other parts of the world, whether it's access to water or safety in an emergency or decent wages or just being treated like a human being that deserves every chance to reach their full potential, right? We work with farm workers in the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, for example, perhaps the, perhaps the only sector of workers that might get paid less than restaurant workers. They had an extraordinary victory in 2009, I think it was, when the entire tomato industry in Florida agreed that perhaps these big purchasers of tomato who were making a profit off of slavery, physical abuse, sexual harassment in the fields, you know, a set of labor conditions that are beyond, you know, beyond two hours of discussion to really mm -hmm. get at how bad they were. Uh, they had this enormous victory, and we were, and they had this code of conduct, just basic rules, no sexual harassment, no, no forced labor, things you don't think you'd have to fight for, right, in, in this day and age in our country, but you do. So when they had their victory, we started interviewing people to see what changed. And they found a family, a woman farm worker and her partner, and they asked them what was important about the new system. Before the new system was set up, before their big victory, they had to get up at 4.30 in the morning to go wait for the bus at 4.45. They would be picked up, taken to the fields, and sit for a few hours, not being paid, until the crops dried and they could start picking. Now, with the new system... They didn't want to pay them those hours. Now they have to pay them for wait time. Um, and they started picking them up at 8, 8.30 in the morning. And we said, well, why is that important? He said, well, because of our son. He's 10 years old, and he, he's never eaten very well. And we used to have to get him up at 4.30 and drop him off at the other trailer half asleep. And we, he wouldn't eat breakfast, and we never knew if he ate lunch. And we worried all day that he you know, wouldn't eat till we got home. But now, now we can make him breakfast. And we can even walk him to school. And to live in a system, in a society that doesn't think that's important if you're poor, that doesn't think being able to have those basic human relationships if you're poor, for me was very emblematic of injustice. And what ties all these stories together is the failure to recognize that rights are not just about rights against, they're rights in relationships. They're rights towards each other. They're a web that we need to create that's grounded in values, not just law, and shift the way we all we function across all these areas. But I think the fundamental problem, and this goes to who we hold responsible, is not just the people who are calling the shots that are problematic. It's the ways in which our own movements have opened up the back door to precisely these kinds of policies by what I call intersectional failure. The failure of anti-racism to be anti-patriarchal, right, means that most of the black families that are led by women are seen as dysfunctional families. Mm -hmm. 
Why is a family dysfunctional? Because a woman leads it. Mm-hmm. And because our idea about anti-racism doesn't extend to stereotypes against black mothers, mm-hmm. which means that they're disproportionately separated from their children, which means that the helicopter can come and say, you have to choose, which means that women who are incarcerated uh, and don't have contact with their children for 17 of 21 months can lose their children and states that are basically encouraged to separate mothers from their children make resources available when the mothers lose their children and not resources available when they have them. Uh We've got the policies, we've got the punitiveness, and we've got the silence. So the question is, when we think about one billion rising, The focus isn't just on neoliberalism, it's on how our own politics, the politics of feminism that don't really address these problems, the politics of anti-racism that really don't talk about what's happening to women, the politics of of globalization that really don't think about and talk about what's happening to low-wage women in the North or in these particular environments. So I would say they come together around an absence of an intersectional politics, an intersectional practice that looks at how all of these systems are converging and importantly how we've allowed them to converge from our silences. Mm -hmm. You talked about the failings of our anti-racist movements to be truly Mm anti-patriarchal. What about our anti-patriarchy movements. Mm -hmm. In our last State of Female America panel, the point was made by Kim, um, that there have been important junctures where, for example, the Violence Against Women movement, the movement against violence (laughs) against women, against domestic violence, made some choices that didn't help the situation in some respects. How are you at V-Day thinking about responses to domestic violence that don't just put more people into jail, particularly black men? Well, I think, I think you know, one of the things we're seeing this year with women everywhere asking the question of what is justice, if one billion women on the planet have been raped and beaten, the solution to me I don't think is going to be locking up two billion men. I think that really will just create another system of oppression, which leads to another system of Although oppression. Although I could make a list of which ones we could lock. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I think part of what I think everybody's looking at, and, and I think Donna was really talking about, everybody's been talking about it, is we keep creating more punitive measures, which keep creating more punitive systems, which keep dislocating and disconnecting us further. If we don't begin to look at origins, if we don't begin to look at what makes people commit injustices, what makes people commit violences, what are, what are the violences that people are, are creating on these, and what are, are the violences that have been wrought on them that bring about those violences? One of the things I'm very excited about is to begin to see these dialogues emerging, but unless we begin to look at the original story that brought us here, the colonization that's brought us here, the neoliberal capitalist systems that have robbed people of their dignities and rights to jobs and rights to incomes and rights to... I mean, I look at Congo, and I want to use that as a perfect example. In the same way you were talking about how we blame people on on the airplane and we say the mother doesn't care about her children, when in fact you look at Congo, which has been colonized, recolonized, over inside, outside colonized, and now is being pillaged and, and, and invaded for the minerals like coltane, which go into our cell phones and playstations. And you look at that war now being essentially fought on the bodies of women. Okay, because in the end, women will be sacrificed the fastest and the cleanest and the, and the quickest because they're, they're the least powerful in, in most, most, most structures. So I, I look at Congo as the time is the kind of the, the case of the world. I'm going to go from you saying we weren't born this way. And I'm going to remember that when capitalism was first trying on its little capitalist legs, <laughs> colonizing people who hadn't lived the capitalist way, They had to force people to stop sharing. They had to force people to privatize the land, to privatize the family, to privatize the problem, their own problem. What can we do? You're the organizer, Saru. Start with you. I I see corporations (laughs) controlling, you know, uh, policy with regard to disaster relief and environmental 
issues, right? Obviously, pr corporations are profiting off the growth of the prison industrial complex. Corporations are obviously at the root of why farm workers are being enslaved and exploited. And there is an opportunity <laughs> to see the connections between these corporate powers and to attack them directly, to organize and attack them. Valentine's Day, um, I think, has so many many different significances. Um, for us, uh, it's the highest grossing day in the restaurant industry, and it's the day after <laughs> our National Day of Action, which is 2-13. Every year on February 13th, 2-13, we do a National Day of Action to highlight the fact that the tip minimum wage is still $2.13 an hour and that it's mostly women. So to us, there, there's an opportunity, in my opinion, for all of us to think about how could we map out the corporate powers that control prison and prison and control the environment, and then think about how could we target them this V-Day? How could we target them together? One of the most powerful things about the civil rights movement is that it came across as very principled. You know, one of the things that the organizers uh, for, for Dr. King would say, we're not just liberating ourselves, we're liberating white people from the oppressive society they've created. The Vermont Worker Center led a healthcare as a human right campaign that has led to the first state in the nation a few years ago committing to universal publicly financed health care for everyone. Okay. That's right. <laughs> this was a, a small worker center that has done what we haven't been able to do in this country since 1947 when Truman first tried to push universal health care. This is a white working class organization, uh, not all white, but mostly. Um, but they prepared themselves well in this campaign. They had all their people take anti you know, do anti-racism uh, anti training. They did a lot. They did their whole campaign under a human rights frame. And that brought some simple but profound messages, which is human rights are universal. They're for everyone. So when they were on the, the eve of winning this his fairly historic legislation, they got a call, as, as the kind of call you don't want to get, from the committee or the subcommittee in the legislature about to send out the bill saying, we're going to add an amendment. Because we think, we think it's too complicated, it might even be legal, we have to exclude the undocumented workers in Vermont, which is mostly the dairy industry. And, you know, nobody will notice. It's going to be very quiet. We're not going to talk about it. So you should just let this one lie, or you might lose the whole thing. And they came together, and they said, well, this is a human rights campaign, and what part of Universal did they not understand? <laughs> Last we heard, those dairy workers were human. I mean, somebody tells us different, we could rethink this thing. And they basically threw themselves on the sword for 1,500 dairy workers and risked their entire legislation uh, because human rights were universal. They won. Yeah. Mm. They had the amendments <laughs> too. We have a mostly white organization who were the first to get undocumented immigrants likely included in a universal health care system. That's a mm -hmm. movement yeah. we can support. Absolutely. And a billion need to rise on principle or all of us will fall together. Mm -hmm. So for me, justice would be people living in dignity and communities that are healthy and sustainable. So how do we get there? And it's really starving the monster. These corporations are thriving on the money we give them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exxon does not operate without tax subsidies like that you would not believe. Right. Mm -hmm. right. That's our money that yeah. we pay to Exxon before they before we even buy their gasoline. Right. Okay? And what these and, and if we don't begin to look at this as something that's in our best interest, what's going on in companies where these companies thrive, where they're doing their worst with extraction? They need destabilized mm -hmm. political Absolutely. governance in order to really mm -hmm. drive it home. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if this applies in the U.S., but in Canada here with the common law and uh, there's something called acquiescence. Acquiescence means your compliance is consent, which means mm -hmm. your silence is consent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for those people that are standing by and not saying anything to the ongoing destruction of all of our lands and the violence against women, mm -hmm. your silence is consent. Mm -hmm. You would never have known that I was a person incarcerated for 27 years if I did not tell you. Right. So that's what I'm trying to say. Don't believe 
what you see on TV. Right. Don't believe what you are told. Go investigate for yourself. Mm -hmm. Listen to what's being told in front of you. Plato's cave. Go outside that box that you have boxed yourself in because it was comfortable. Mm -hmm. Step outside your comfort zone because outside your comfort zone is your world. Mm -hmm. It's the real world. Mm -hmm. You do not live in a real world in your box. Mm -hmm. The real world will not hurt you, but you will hurt the world mm -hmm. if you stay inside of that box. What I've heard throughout the conversation um, is the need to actually find the connections and have the difficult conversations among us, not just with our opponents. So um, when, when Monique was talking about um, how corporate greed is permitted, the reason why it's permitted is because we focus on the other, not on who has actual power. The reason why our politicians are able to do what they do is because we use color-coded interpretations of what we think they're about as opposed to who really owns them. So we have a sponsored democracy. If we're going to exploit each other and the land, we have to be alienated from it, right? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't take Marx to know that. Right. We've got to knit back those relationships and, and those connections. I want to look at justice as connected connection and how we connect causes and consequences, how we connect the whole story of violence. So it's a systemic disorder, not an individual problem. I think for so long we've been addressing violence as if it's my problem, my particular woman problem, as opposed to being connected to a racist, patriarchal, neoliberal, capitalist framework. And unless we begin to hook this up, we're never going to move it further.